The following is a special broadcast of the radio drama, Two Sharp Knives. This radio drama was created through a collaborative effort between the Parkland College students of COM 140 and 142 classes. It was produced entirely by Parkland students using equipment, resources, and studio space at Parkland College. And now WPCD presents Two Sharp Knives. Tonight, Columbia brings you as guest star Hollywood's genial character actor, Shea Drew. The story is the author of The Thin Man and the Maltese Falcon, Dashiell Hammett, one of America's acknowledged masters in the art of suspense. Suspense is compounded of mystery and intrigue and dangerous adventure. In this series are stories calculated to intrigue you and to stir your nerves to offer you a precarious situation and then withhold the solution to the last possible moment. And tonight, for instance, Shea Drew plays for us a pleasant, easygoing assistant chief of police in a small town who, to everyone's surprise, was instrumental in solving a murder. We trust that with this tale, we shall keep you in suspense. For Suspense Tonight, CBS presents Shea Drew and Two Sharp Knives by Dashiell Hammett. Shortly after 2 a.m., a poker game had just broken up at Ben Camsley's, the doctor coroner of Deerwood City. Susan Anderson, Deerwood's chief of police, and Wally Shane, her assistant, were standing outside. Where are we heading for, Susan? Let's walk across the street, Wally. Railroad station. Gee, aren't you afraid of the excitement, Chief? Don't think that watching the 211 come in is apt to be too much for your blood pressure? Well, if it is, Wally, you can always carry on. You've been a pretty good imitation of an assistant to me for some time now. Yeah? Yeah. If anything happens to me, you'd be the chief. Don't worry. It won't be any harder for you to fool the public as chief. Hi, Elmer. Howdy, Susan. Hello, Wiley. Kind of a late for you boys to be around, ain't it? No, I don't know. We sort of figured we'd put the town to bed tonight. How's the 211? On time? Right on the nose. She ought to be blowing through the bend in in just about three seconds now. <coughs> yep, what I tell you? That's her now. Expecting anyone on her. Susie? No, Elmer, I'm not expecting anyone. Wally and I just thought we'd come over and watch it come in, that's all. You know, Elmer, you can never tell who might get off, though. Dick Turpin, Harry Morgan, Jesse James, Jack the Ripper, six officers of Murder Incorporated, or even your Aunt Gussie. I guess you're right, Wally. Well, here she be. Pardon me, gents, but I gotta be rolling. The wagon out to the baggage car. Deerwood! Deerwood! Hi, Elmer. How's it going? Can't complain, Cap. Well, maybe you can't, Elmer, but I sure can. If you hold us up with that freight there, you got much more? Nope. This is the last piece now. There you are, Cap. All done. Okay. See you out tomorrow, Elmer. Board? Board? Hey, Susan. Do you see what I see? If you mean, do I see the man that just got off that train, the answer's yes. Well, he's a ringer for the guy we got a picture of. That is the guy. Well then, what do we do now? We take him, Wally. My car's at the corner of the alley. Oh, but Susan... We, we tail him up the street. Okay, Susan. There he goes now, over toward the taxi stand. Come on, let's follow him. Hello, Furman. Huh? Oh. I... I don't believe I You're have... Lester Furman, aren't you? Yes. Yes, I am. Philadelphia? Yes. I'm Susan Anderson, Chief of Police. What? Chief of... What happened to her? Happened to who? Oh, oh no, you don't. Let me go. If you think you could pull that sort of stuff with me, you're very much mistaken. Okay, let me get a crack at that mug. Now hold on. Now, now, now. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold it, Wally. Well, Furman? Well, I'm... I'm... I'm sorry. For a moment there, I thought you weren't really a policeman. Thanks. Nice to know I look almost human. Yes. It... it was very silly of me. I'm... I'm sorry. Well, let's get going now before anything else happens. Okay, Furman, get in the car. 
I'll drive, Susan. In you go. Are, are you taking me to police headquarters? That's right. What for? Philadelphia. I... Uh, I don't understand. You understand that you're wanted in Philadelphia for murder, don't you? Murder? Why, that's ridiculous. That's... Who told you that? Well, it's a cinch you didn't make it up. But wait, there must be some kind of mistake. I don't know what Take you're talking- Take it easy now. Just wait till we get down to headquarters, and I'll show you what I mean. Now then, here's the circular on Lester Furman. It was sent out by the Transamerica Detective Agency in Philadelphia. Take a look. Hmm. Oh yes. $1,500 reward for the arrest and conviction of Lester Furman, alias Lloyd Fields, alias J.D. Carpenter, for the, for the murder of Paul Frank Dunlap in Philadelphia on December 8th, 1942? Well? It's a lie. You're Furman, aren't you? Yes, but... That's your picture on the circular, ain't it? Yes, yes, but I... Well, Susan, I see you and Wally got Furman, huh? Oh, hello, George. Ah, uh, you lucky stiffs. Now you two split a grand and a half reward. Never seen nothing like it. You know, if it ain't vacations in New York at the city's expense, it's reward, though. George, someday, if you don't remember, you're the jailer around here and not the DA. Huh? You're gonna be wearing your teeth on the outside of your lips, and I'll be the woman who will arrange them that way, savvy? Eh, just cause you caught some stiff who's hot in Philadelphia. It's a lie! It's a frame-up! You can't prove anything. There's nothing to prove. I never killed anybody. I won't be framed. Take it easy, Furman. Take it easy. You're wasting your breath on us. Save it for the Philadelphia police. We're just holding you for them. But it's not the police. It's the Trans-America Detective Agency. We turn you over to the Philadelphia police. Miss Anderson, I... I... Well... Then, then there's nothing I can do now. There's nothing any of us can do till morning. We'll have to search you now, then we won't bother you anymore till they come for you. But I have rights and I... Wally, you look through his bag and I'll see what he's got in his pockets. All right, Susan. Well, all he's got on him are some business cards, a few letters, a hundred and... Sixty... A hundred and sixty dollars, a book of checks in Philadelphia Bank, and a few odds and ends. What's with the bag, Wally? Not much. Couple of changes of clothes, some toilet articles, and... Oh, here's a 38. Loaded. Pretty little thing, isn't it? Okay, put those things in what I got in the vault. All right, George, you can take Furman now and lock him up. This is the most ridiculous thing I've Come ever had along, to... Come along, darling. Come on. We ain't had nobody in our little who's gal for three days running. There you are. Now you'll have it all to yourself. Just like a suite at the Ritz, huh? But I do not belong go in here. Go on, in you go. I tell you, you're making a mistake. I demand to be allowed to get in touch with my lawyer. I have rights. Hey, how about you boys cutting me in on a little of that blood money, huh? Oh, sure, George, sure. I'll forget all about that two and a half you've been owing me for two and a half months. Make Furman as comfortable as you can, George. Take good care of him. He's valuable, huh? Yeah, now if it was some bum that didn't mean a nickel to you, it wouldn't make a George, lick of difference what I did. any day now I'm going to forget that your uncle is county chairman and throw you back in the gutter just to see how high you'll bounce. Remember that. Uh, Susan, I, I didn't mean nothing. That's all, George. Never mind the rest. I'm going home now. If anything's urgent, I can be reached there. But get this. I don't want to be disturbed unless it is urgent. Hello? Hello? Susan, this is Wally. Yeah, Wally, what time is it? It's five after six in the morning and you better come right down. That fella Furman's hung himself. What? Furman hung himself? Yeah, by his belt. From a window bar, deader than a mackerel. I'll be right in, Wally. Phone Doc Camsley and tell him I'll pick him up on my way down. No doctor's gonna do Furman any good, Susan. Well, it won't hurt to have him looked at. You better phone the county court at Douglasville, too, and file a routine report. Already did that. And what's more, hold on to your seat. 
The DEA is on her way over. In person. The DEA? Yeah. I'll be there before you hang up, Wally. Come on in, Chief. Tammy Carroll, the DA, is here, and she's plenty hot under the collar. What's she burning about? Oh, she's just mad. Running up quite a phone bill on us, too. Been calling Philadelphia every couple of minutes since she got here. What kept you so long? Oh, I couldn't get my car started. Well, let's go in and see the old buzzard. Hello, Tammy. Listen, Susan, what is all this? All what? There's some funny business going on here. What's funny about it? Man hangs himself? Just another case of suicide. Sure, it was suicide, but I just telephoned Transamerica and dug a guy out of bed there, and he said they'd never sent out circulars on Furman, didn't know about any murder he was wanted for. All they could tell me about him was he used to be a client of theirs. I don't know what to say, Tammy. I don't either. No, a fine chief of police you are. What on earth kept you so long? Car stalled. Came as quick as I could. What makes you so crabby, Tammy? <laughs> Nothing. I guess it's just the district attorney in me. Oh, come on, come on. Nobody knew you two were s such staunch admirers of each other. <laughs> okay, Wally. Tell me, what do you make of it? Well, there's plenty wrong, Susan. First, the Transamerica thing. They never sent out circulars on Furman. And now, get this, I talked to the Philly police just before you came in and there wasn't even any Paul Frank Dunlap murdered. There wasn't? No. What did you get out of Furman before you let him hang himself? Well, that he was innocent. Didn't you grill him? Didn't you find out what he was doing in town? Wally, didn't you? What for? He admitted he was Furman. The description fitted him. The photograph was him. The Transamerica Detective Agency is supposed to be on the level, ain't it? Philadelphia wanted Furman, not us. But Scott... Why, sure, Tammy. If I'd have known he would hang himself. Yeah, but then if your aunt wore pants, she'd be your uncle. You said Furman had been a client of Transamerica. They tell you what job they did for him? His wife left him a couple of years ago, and he had them hunting for five or six months, but they never found her. They're sending a man up there tonight to look things over. They are, huh? Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm going out and grab a quick bite, but I might as well tell you, Susan, there's going to be trouble over this. I know that, Tammy. There usually is when someone dies in a jail cell. Well, well, so what's become of that 1,500 fish now, huh, Susan? What happened here last night, George? Nothing. Furman hung himself. Did you find him? Uh-uh. Wally took a look in here to see how things was before he went off duty, and he found him. You were asleep, I suppose. Well, I, I was catching a nap, I guess, but everybody does that sometimes, Susan. I mean, even Wally, when he comes in off his beat between rounds... Yeah, but I always wake up when the phone rings or anything. Oh, sure. Well, suppose I had been awake. You can't hear a guy hanging himself, can you? Did Doc Camsley say how long Furman had been dead? He'd done it about 5 o'clock, he said he guessed. Oh, Susan, if uh, you want to look at the remains, they're over at Fritz's undertaking parlor. Not now. Hey, and uh, speaking of Furman, what are you going to tell the folks from Transamerica when they show up here tonight? Come in, come in. Oh, they told me I'd find you here. You're Chief Anderson, aren't you? Yes, that's right. I'm Kara Reesing, Assistant Manager of the Transamerica Detective Agency in Philadelphia. This is Mrs. Wheelock, who is Lester Furman's personal attorney. Glad to know you, Mrs. Reesing. How do you do, Mrs. Wheelock? How do you do? I know you both are already in possession of most of the details concerning Mr. Furman from the time he arrived in Deerwood until the time of his death. But perhaps you don't know that the police of most towns in our corner of the state have also received copies of this same reward circular. Take a look at it. Oh. Hmm. I must say, this circular is an excellent forgery. You're sure it's a forgery, Mrs. Reesing? Oh, yes. There's no doubt about it. But it's an excellent forgery. 
Tell me, Mrs. Wheelock, was Mr. Furman a native Philadelphian? Oh my, yes. He was a well-known, respectable, and prosperous citizen of Philadelphia. Married, I believe? In 1934, he married a 22-year-old girl named Ethel Bryan, daughter of a Philadelphia family. And the Furmans had a child, isn't that right, Mrs. Wheelock? Yes, born in 1936, but the child lived only a few months. Mr. Furman's wife disappeared after the child's death. What year was that that she disappeared? Miss Reesing should remember that. Her agency worked on the matter. Oh, I remember it well. Mrs. Furman disappeared in 1937. We never heard anything of her again. Although, Furman spent a lot of money trying to locate her. What did she look like, Mrs. Reesing? Ah, just a moment. I have a picture of her right here in my briefcase. Ah, here it is. Quite pretty, isn't she? Sure. Judging by this photo, I'd say that she's a small-featured, pretty blonde with a weak mouth and large, somewhat staring eyes. Oh, that's an accurate enough description, all right. If you don't mind, I'd like to have a copy made of that photograph, Mrs. Reesing. Oh, you can keep that one, if you like. It's one that we'll, we made up at the Transamerica. Her description's on the back. Thanks. Did Furman ever divorce her? No, ma'am. He was a lot in love with her, and he seemed to think that the child's dying made it her a little screwy so that she didn't know what she was doing. That right, isn't it, Mrs. Wheelock? That is my belief, Miss Reesing. You said Furman had money, Mrs. Wheelock. About how much did she have? And who gets it? I should say his estate will amount to perhaps a half a million dollars, left in its entirety to his wife. Mm-hmm, that's quite a handy sum for anyone to have, I'd say. Mrs. Wheelock, everything shows that somebody framed Furman into the Deerwood jail, and that frame-up drove him to suicide. But there has to be something else, a lot else. Well, then, what are you going to do? I'm going across the street to the undertaking parlor and have a look at Furman. I'll see you later. Hi, Susan. I figured you'd come over here to The Undertaker's pretty soon. What's on your mind, Doc? Let's get out of this crowd. I want to tell you something. I just got rid of two people in my office. Let's go back there. Suits me. Two of the bruises showed, Susan. What bruises? Furman, up on the hair, there were two bruises. Why didn't you tell me? I'm telling you now, Susan. You weren't here when I made my examination. This is the first time I've seen you since then. Why didn't you spill the stuff about Furman's bruises when you were testifying at the inquest then? I'm a friend of yours. Do I want to put you in a spot where people can say you drove this chap to suicide by third degree in him too rough? Ah, uh, you're nuts. How bad was Furman's head? Well, Susan, that didn't kill him. If that's what you mean, there's nothing the matter with his skull. Just a couple of bruises nobody'd notice unless they parted the hair. I thought you ought to know, though. Well, thanks, Ben. Yes, who is it? This is Fritz, the undertaker. Listen, Susan, uh, there's a couple of ladies over here that want to take a look at Furman. Is it all right? Who are they? I don't know them. Strangers. What do they want to see him for? I don't know. Wait a minute. Can't I please see him? Why do you want to see him? Well, I'm... I'm his wife. Furman's wife? Yes. Oh, 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 certainly. Be right over. So long, Ben. I gotta go back to The Undertaker's. So long, Susan. Hey, Susan? What do you want, Wally? I want to talk to you a minute. Over here, where we won't be seen. Okay, what is it? A couple of dames came into Fritz's undertaking place just as I was leaving. 
One of them's Hacha Randall, a babe with a record as long as your arm. She's one of that mob you had me working on in New York last summer. She know you? Sure, but not by my right name. She thinks I'm a Detroit run rummer. I mean, did she recognize you just now? I don't think she saw me. Anyway, she didn't give me a tumble. You don't know the other one? No, she's a blonde. Kind of pretty. Okay, Wally. Stick around a while, but stay out of sight. Maybe I'll bring them back with me. Whatever you say, Chief. Oh, there you are, Susan. I wondered when you were coming. This is Mrs. Furman, and this is Mrs. Crowder. How do you do? Hi, your chief. They just saw the body. Mrs. Crowder? I thought your name was Randall. What do you care, chief? I'm not hurting your town any. <laughs> Don't call me chief. To you, city slickers, I'm the town whittler. Thank you for letting me see him. It's all right, Mrs. Furman, but I'll have to ask you and your friends some questions. So if you'll just come across the street to the headquarters, we can get on with the routine. I want to tell you something. Mrs. Furman, your husband didn't commit suicide. He was murdered. Murdered? Aw, oh, Chief, we got alibis. We were in New York, and we can prove it. And you're likely to get a chance to. What brought you down here anyway? Murdered? Well, who's got a better right to come down here? She was still his wife, wasn't she? She's got a right to look out for her own interests, hasn't she? Uh-huh. Oh, that reminds me of something. Excuse me a second. I've got to make a phone call in the next room. This is Susan. Yes? Is Wally around? No. He's not here. He said you told him to keep out of sight. I'll find him for you, though. Right. Tell Wally I want him to go to New York tonight. Send Mason home to get some rest. He'll have to take over Wally's night trick. Okay. Mrs. Anderson? Mrs. Anderson, do you think I had... had anything to do with Lester's... with his death? I don't know, Mrs. Furman. I know he was killed. I also know he left you something like half a million. Wow, dollars? Dollars. All right, Chief, let's stop clowning. The kid here didn't have a thing to do with whatever you think happened. No? No. We read about Lester Furman committing suicide in yesterday morning's paper and about there being something funny about it, and I persuaded her she ought to come down and see. Mrs. Anderson, I wouldn't have done anything to hurt Lester. I left him because I wanted to leave him. I wouldn't have done anything to hurt him for money or anything else. Had I wanted money from him, I would only have had to ask him for it. That's the truth, Chief. For years I've been telling Ethel she was a chump not to tap him. But she never would. I wouldn't have hurt him. Why did you leave him then? Oh, I don't know how to say it. The way we lived wasn't the way I wanted to live. I wanted... Oh, I don't know what. Anyway, after the baby died, I... I couldn't stand it anymore. Excuse me. Hello? Oh, yeah, Hamill? Hmm, you gave Wally the message? Yes, yes, I want him to go to New York tonight. Okay, where is he, home? He is home, huh? Okay, thanks. Mrs. Furman, this circular that got your husband into jail, did you ever see that picture before? No. Why, that's... Oh, it can't be. It, it's a snapshot I had, well, have. It's an enlargement of it. Who else has one? N nobody that I know of. I don't think anyone else could have one. You've still got yours? Yes. 
don't remember whether I've seen it recently. It's with some old papers and things, but I must have it. Well, Mrs. Furman, it's stuff like that that's got to be checked up. And neither of us can dodge it. Now there's two ways we can play it. Yes. Mrs. Furman, I can hold you here on suspicion till I've had time to investigate things. Or I can send one of our men with you to check up in New York. Yes. I'm willing to do that if you'll speed things up by helping him all you can. And if you promise you won't try any tricks. I promise. I'm as anxious as you are to... All right, all right. How'd you come down? We drove down. We got a, bra- a great big car. That's my car, see? That big green job across the street. Oh. Yeah. Then my man can ride back with you. But no funny business. Ah, oh, don't worry, Chief. Come on, we're going to see Wally Shane, the man who's going to drive you to New York. Wally? Who is it? Susan, Wally. Come in. Go on. Harry? Harry! Ethel? No, you don't. No, you don't. No use reaching for that gun, Wally. I've already got you covered. I guess you win, Susan. Yeah, I guess I do. Come along back to headquarters with me like a good little boy. Wally, you're under arrest for murder. Well, and that's how I knew it was all up, Susan, the minute I saw those dames going into Fritz's. Then when I was ducking out of sight, I ran into you, and I was afraid you'd take me over there with you. So I had to tell you one of them knew me, figuring you'd want to keep me undercover for a little while longer, anyhow. Long enough for me to get out of town. Why didn't you get out, Wally? Well, I drop in home to pick up a couple of things before I scram, and that phone call of Hamels catches me, and, and I fall for it. You see, Susan, I figured you're not on to me yet, and you're going to send me back to New York to see what dope I can get out of those dames. Well, you fooled me, Chief. Kind of thought you'd fall for that. Then you didn't just stumble into all this accidentally, did you? No, I didn't, Wally. I figured Furman had to be murdered by a copper. Only a copper would know reward circulars well enough to make a good job of forging one. Incidentally, who printed that Furman circular for you, Wally? I'm not dragging anybody in with me. It was only a poor mug that needed dough. Okay, Wally. You see, I knew only a copper would be sure enough of the routine to know how things would be handled. Only one of my coppers would be able to walk into Furman's cell, bang him across the head, and string him up on the... Those bruises showed, you know, Wally. They did? I guess I should have wrapped two towels around that blackjack. Well, gee, Susan, I seem to have slipped up on a lot of things. So that narrows it down to my coppers, and... Well, you told me you knew the Randall woman. There it was. Only I figured you were working with them. What got you like this, Wally? Same thing that gets most saps into jams. A yen for easy dough. I was in New York, see, Susan, working that Dutton job for you, palling around with the big shot racketeers, passing for one of them, and... Yes? Well, I got to figuring that my work takes more brains than theirs, and they're taking in big money, and I'm working for coffee and cakes. That kind of stuff gets to you, Susan. Anyway, it got me. Mm Mm-hmm. Then I ran into this Ethel Furman, and she goes for me like a house of fire. I liked her, too, see? So that's dandy. But one night she tells me about how much dough her husband's got and how he feels about her, and I get to thinking. Thinking what? I think she's nuts enough about me to marry me. So I get to thinking, suppose he died and left her his role. I see. So I run down to Philly a couple of afternoons and look firm and up, and everything looks fine. I took my time working out the details, meanwhile writing to her through a fellow in Detroit. Go on, finish. Well, I decided to do it. I sent those circulars out. To a lot of places, not wanting to point too much to this one. And then when I was ready, I phoned Furman, telling him to come to the Deerwood Hotel that night, and sometime before the next night, he'd hear from his wife, Ethel. I knew we'd fall for any trap that was baited with her. Only I guess I'm not as sharp as I thought I was, Susan. Maybe you are, Wally. Maybe you are. But that doesn't always help. Old man Camsley, Ben's father, used to have a saying, 
To a sharp knife comes a tough steak. Well, sorry you did it, Wally. I always liked you. I know you did, Susan. I was counting on that. And so ends Dashiell Hammett's Two Sharp Knives, starring Shay Drew. Tonight's story of suspense. Columbia presents these tales of mystery and intrigue and dangerous adventure for your relaxation and enjoyment. Next week, suspense will not be heard because of a special holiday broadcast, Columbia's review of the events of the year, 12 Crowded Months, which has been scheduled. On the following Tuesday, January 5th, there'll be another in the series, same hour, 9.30 Eastern Wartime. William Spire, the producer, John Dietz, the director, and Bernard Herman, the composer and collaborators, on suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>